Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Within approximately a thousand yards of where I'm standing here in the city of Jerusalem was where the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And that was the beginning of what was called the ecclesia in Greek or translated in your Bible, the church. The church started with 120 people in Acts chapter 1. On the day of Pentecost, five, uh, there was actually 3,000 converted. On the day of Pentecost, so that was, that was 3,120. Before the week was over, another 5,000 was converted. That's 8,120. And so now the church universally, with all the different denominations involved, has literally hundreds of millions of people, perhaps some estimate up to 1.8 to 2 billion people who profess Christianity or the Christian faith that are part of the invisible church, meaning churches that are underground, churches that have no buildings, and the visible church that you see in nations where there is freedom for Christianity with mega churches and congregations. I don't want to talk about the church so much as I want to talk about the person, the individual called the Holy Spirit who helped initiate something in the city of Jerusalem that you need to know about. For the next few moments, I'm going to preach on a word and break that word down and tell you about the paraclete advantage. In John chapter 16, 15, Jesus makes this statement to his disciples. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for, for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the comforter will not come. But, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, let me give you the setting of this verse. The setting of this verse is Jesus is about to tell his disciples that he's going to go away and to prepare a place for them. They wanted to see the Father. So Jesus introduces himself and said, if you've seen me, you have seen the heavenly Father. Then they get worried because you've got to understand these are men that have given up everything to follow Christ. They've left their businesses and families behind to go and follow Jesus in his ministry. Now Jesus is about to tell them that he's leaving them. But he says to them, I am not going to leave you comfortless. I am going to send you another comforter and this comforter is going to stay with you. Now the Greek word comforter is a word orphanos. It's where we get the English word orphan from. If you're translating that today, you would say this, I am not going to leave you an orphan, but I'm going to send you a comforter. Now, in, when I looked at this word uh, orphanos in the Greek, and I began to get the broader meaning of it, in the broader meaning, meaning, here's what it represents. It represented students who were abandoned by their teachers, not just a child who did not have a father and mother. That's our traditional English term, orphan. But in the original Greek, it can have the connotation of a teacher who leaves his students and leaves them without any help, any assistance, or any mentoring, or any instruction. Now, when you look at it this way, you understand what Jesus is saying to the disciples. They are young. I mean, most of these men had been converted to the Lord uh, in his ministry. Some had been followers of John the Baptist, but most of them had been following Christ for pro probably a little over three years, three years and three, uh, six months, three years and ten months. And so now he's telling them he's leaving them. This would be like a pastor that you love that's built a great church, a mega church, and it's going wonderfully. People are being touched and healed and delivered. And suddenly he gets up and says, well, guys, I hate to tell you this, but I'm about to go away and I'm about to leave you. It would devastate a church that loves their pastor. Well, imagine how these disciples felt. Wait a minute. I mean, when we need food, you can multiply bread. When we're in a boat and about to sink, you can not only walk on water, but you know how to calm a storm. All these multitudes, what are we going to do after you're gone? So he says to them, I am going to give you another comforter. Now, it's that word comforter that's really interesting in the Greek because it's the Greek word perikletos, and that word basically means this. In fact, when I did a word study on this, I began to realize something. It actually means to call alongside of someone to assist them, to call alongside of someone to assist them. Now, from a legal perspective, this would have been a person who assists another person in a court case. It's a person that takes up the evidence in a court case to defend a person who may be accused. And that's one of the 
possible meanings of that word, not from the biblical perspective, but from the Roman time, from what we call the legal perspective. So this is interesting, and I want to say this with you. Jesus is called an advocate, and that's found in 1 John 2 and 1. Beloved, we write to you that you sin not, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Then we find out that when Jesus leaves, he gives us another comforter. Now, these Greek words are basically the same. It's the word perikletos or the word periklete. And so these particular words show us something very important that every one of you need to hear, and that is this. That we have a, a assistant, assistant, a personal assistant on earth, and we have a personal assistant in heaven. Our assistant in heaven who personally assists us in our spiritual matters is Jesus Christ, who is said to be the high priest of the profession of our faith, who is seated at the right hand of God, ever living to make intercession for us. So he's in heaven. However, on the earth, since the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, the Holy Spirit has been present on this planet to assist the believer on earth. So in other words, Romans 8 makes a lot of sense. We don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So we have what we would term an intercessor, meaning one that stands in the gap on our behalf and prays for us, but he doesn't just pray for us because he can't pray without us. Let me say that again. The Holy Spirit prays for us, but he can't pray without us. I cannot go and shoot hoops, play basketball, or go fishing and say to the Holy Spirit, you know what, uh, I want to hang out with the guys five hours today, so would you just kind of step over your Holy Spirit and go in my prayer closet and pray for me? It doesn't work that way. He has to pray with you. The Spirit helps our infirmities, and the word helpeth means to take hold of together with. So the Holy Spirit who is on earth, who dwells in the believer, has to pray through the believer and use our words in order to make intercession in heaven. And so when we pray, and for me it would be the English language, for some of you it would be Russian, some of you it would be Hebrew, depending on where you're, you're born and the language that you speak, that would be your native tongue, wherever, whatever country you're from. So when I'm praying, remember this, I have the Holy Spirit praying in me and through me to the Father, and Jesus in heaven is making intercession for me. As a matter of fact, Revelation 12 said, Satan is the accuser of the brethren before God day and night, and Christ is ever living to make intercession for you and I. And so this is important to understand that we have a helper in heaven, a paraclete in heaven, and we have one on the earth who one is making intercession in heaven. And watch this. So Jesus in heaven, what, what does Jesus think? What does he feel? What does he want me to know? You know how he speaks? He speaks from heaven back to the helper on earth who is the Holy Spirit. This is how, according to Romans 8, the will of God is revealed as the, as the Spirit prays through us to Jesus, and then Jesus in return talks back to the Holy Spirit in us. Now that's the reason why a lot of times you'll get what some people call an inclination. You'll get a, these are some terms I've used over the years. I've got a gut feeling. I've got this really strange feeling. I have this uh, inward uh, something telling me this. And a lot of times what that is, that can be Christ who is speaking to the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. And the Holy Spirit who dwells in your spirit is relaying that information back to your mind. And this is how a lot of times we find the will of God. This is uh, not, not a lot of times. That's how you find the will of God. This is how you get direction for things that you're praying for. This is how God gives you answers to prayer is not just by praying to God and praying to Christ, but Christ who is in heaven speaking back to the Holy Spirit. So in Romans 8, the Holy Spirit prays through us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the Holy Spirit can pray in what's called unknown tongues, which is what basically the prayer language of the Spirit. And then we discover that the Holy Spirit also prays through, through you through inspiration in the language that you understand. But when those languages are coming out of your mouth, they're automatically being heard in heaven. Your words are being heard in heaven. And Christ is hearing your words. And when he wants to bring the answer back, he sends it back to you. So what is the paraclete advantage? What is the advantage to having within you the Holy Spirit? There must be an advantage. And I'm going to give these to you very quickly because these are some of the things that I think is interesting. Number one, the advantage of having the Holy Spirit is he goes with you everywhere you go. 
Now, this is fantastic because if you have to travel, you maybe you're a businessman and you've got to travel to other countries, you can step off the plane in other countries and you can feel the spiritual atmosphere shifting. Like, for example, uh, in America, there are cities in America that I go to and I sleep real well in the hotel. I have a great meeting that weekend. And there's a couple cities in America that no matter when I've ever gone to those cities, my sleep is disrupted. There's something happening in the atmosphere. But see, the good news is when I step off my plane, the Holy Spirit has stepped off of it with me. And I take Him wherever I'm staying. I take Him wherever I'm preaching. So there is an advantage that the Holy Spirit is with you. I love what I wrote down here. And i got to tell you this, Matthew 28 and verse 20, you are never alone. If you're a believer, even though you're by yourself, you are never alone because the Spirit of God is with you. And Jesus said, hey, I'll go with you always, even unto the end. The second thing is you're always being watched. First Peter chapter 3 and 12, you know, the eyes of the Lord are forever upon the righteous. So even though you're by yourself, and I don't know who I'm talking to, I feel like I'm talking to people that sometimes have to travel by yourself. You're alone a lot of times, and sometimes you feel that loneliness, but you're never alone when you have the paraclete who is the Holy Spirit. And God is always watching over you. And the third note I made is this, Proverbs 18, 24, you have a friend that can stick closer than a brother. And that is Christ and the Holy Spirit sticking closer to you than a brother. Now, the second thing I want to share with you is simply this. And I wrote this down. I want to give it to you. The Holy Spirit can go into a battle and see it before the warfare ever begins. In 2 Kings chapter 6, what is one of the funniest stories of the entire Bible, the, the Syrian army is secretly planning to attack Israel. So they make their plans in secret. But when they invade Israel, the soldiers of Israel are not there. This happens on uh, several occasions. And finally, the king of Syria is told, the problem you're having, king, is not that you have a traitor in your army that's revealing secrets. It's that there's a prophet in Israel who goes into his prayer closet and tells God, his God tells him where you're going to be. You're going to have to have that guy arrested. You're going to have to put him in prison or something if you want to win the battle. Of course, you know the story how they showed up on the mountain and Elijah, God blinded the entire Syrian army and the prophet took them captive instead of them taking him prisoner. So this is an example of how the Holy Spirit can show you the warfare that's being planned against you before the warfare ever begins. And anyone that knows military strategy knows that one of the greatest ways of obtaining a victory is to know where your enemy is coming from and the weapons that he's using and how he's going to use them before he ever gets there. Because what you do at that point is you plan your counter strategy based on what you know and the knowledge you have. To go in a war totally blind and not know how many soldiers you're fighting and what weapons they have. I mean, even, even the Lord talks about that no one even goes to battle till they first count the cost and see what they're dealing with. The good thing is the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth according to what John wrote and what Jesus said. So what that means is that the Holy Spirit will let you know in advance battles that are coming. You'll get restless in your spirit. You'll see something in your mind and you'll say, you know what, this looks like this could turn into a warfare. And then what happens is he gives you wisdom how to overcome it. Now Romans 8, 26 through 28 says the spirit helps our infirmities. And that Greek word there means weaknesses. And one of the things I want to tell you is this, the Holy Spirit knows how to pray you out of trouble. He knows how to pray you out of trouble. So in other words, when you're in a situation and you don't know how to get out of it, uh, you're in a, in a situation that has suddenly come and maybe it's a sudden attack of the enemy, remember this, go to prayer and do what Romans 8 teaches, to pray in the Spirit. Because when you pray in the Spirit, you will pray the mind of God. You can pray the mind of the Holy Spirit. And this is how the Holy Spirit prays you out of trouble. Many years ago, my father was going to visit his parents in Ohio, and he was driving late one evening, and he stopped at a rest stop. The only vehicle there was a van with tinted windows. Now, my dad didn't know who was in that van. He was actually stopping to go to the men's room. And as he went to open the door, uh, uh, just, just, you know, he turned the key off and he went to open the door. The Lord spoke to him that quick and said, there are four hippies. Now that's the word the Lord used. There are four hippies in that van watching you. And when you go into the restroom, they're going to come in and rob you and you're going to be seriously maimed and injured. Now my dad didn't think twice. He snapped his fingers because he knew by the spirit they're watching him. And he reached in and put his key back in. He, he was acting like he was looking under his seat for something. He cranked the car, got in took his elbow and locked the door. And when he backed out, four men 
jumped out of that van and literally were trying to run toward his car. And he pulled, I said, what did you do? He said, this is real funny for you truck drivers that's watching. He said, all I heard was put the pedal to the metal. He says, I don't know. I just got out of there. God spared my father from an injury because the Spirit of God knew that there was a struggle and a a, a physical assault coming. But he also gave dad the wisdom to know how to get out of that problem and out of that assault. Jude verse 20 says this, But ye, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, by praying in the Holy Spirit. So praying in the Holy Spirit, or we would say praying in the prayer language of the Holy Spirit, is what builds up the inward spirit and it edifies you and it builds you up and it builds your faith. And so we need to learn how to exercise the gift of the Spirit and to operate in the things of God to have the paraclete advantage that I'm teaching you today about right here from the what they call the traditional tomb of Absalom in the city of Jerusalem. Now, another thing I want to share with you, and that is this, that when I study the ministry of Jesus and I study how the Spirit of God was upon him and anointed him to preach the gospel and anointed him to deliver men and women, I began to look at something, and there's two things, and I call these the two master keys that you have to understand about having the paraclete advantage. Number one is this, knowing the will of God for your life and your purpose is one of the greatest keys to knowing and surviving any attack the enemy sends. Let me give an example of this. King David was to be the next king when Saul was out of power. Of course, Saul had to die for that prophecy to be fulfilled. Now, there was a couple times it looked like David lost his confidence in himself and maybe even his faith in God. But he kept on fighting because he knew, I may be at Ziglag today, have lost everything, but God told me I'm headed to Zion. So he knew the will of God. Moses is another example. Moses was 40 years in the wilderness. He was 40 years old when he went to the wilderness for 40 years to watch Jethro's sheep. But you know, at age 80, God brought him and said, I'm going to bring you out and you're going to lead the children of Israel out. Now the enemy tried to kill Moses when he was an infant, but he was unsuccessful. And here's the reason why. Because Moses had a divine destiny that was established by the Lord and the Lord helped bring it to pass. Notice this in the ministry of Jesus. Have you ever noticed the number of times in the ministry of Jesus it says something like this, that they tried to stone him, but his hour had not yet come. They tried to kill him, but his hour had not yet come. Then all of a sudden we read, and his hour came. Notice this. The enemy could not take out Jesus because Jesus knew the will of God. He knew you can't stone me and kill me. You can't throw me off a cliff at Nazareth and kill me. You can't drown me in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. You cannot slay me on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem because he says, I have an assignment from God. And until my assignment is totally complete, until my assignment is finished, you're not going to be able to touch me. Now, someone says, well, that sounds like arrogance to me. No, it is the power of knowing the will of God. When you know, for example, that God has showed you things that's supposed to happen that's not happened and you're really following His will, you can have confidence that everything is going to be all right. You know, several years ago, we had a 421 plane and I was sitting on the right seat. My pilot was in the left seat. We were coming to, from Madisonville, Kentucky to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we lost a right engine. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a plane that small that loses an engine, but I'm telling you what, you'll repent of anything you didn't do, you thought you did, and you might have thought about doing. And I mean... I'm just telling you something. It was a weird feeling. So I began to say, what happens if the other engine goes out? We found out later that a starter, a boat bolt had come loose and the starter adapter had come loose in the engine. It was a piston engine and it ate the gears up in midair. So I'm flying on one engine at night, 13,000 feet in the air, 20 minutes from Chattanooga, Tennessee. So the pilot radioed an emergency and they said, do you want to try to land in one of these smaller airports here? There's nobody there. It's not open. And he said, no, we're going to try to make it to Chattanooga. Now, here's what I fought with. I thought to myself, well, maybe this is the time for me to go. Am I going to go this way? Lord, I know of a hundred other ways I'd rather go than in a plane crash. And I had to rebuke fear, first of all. Then all of a sudden, my spirit started rising up in me. And I began to remember that I was building a building. And I also remembered three things the Lord had given me by revelation. And I knew it was from Him that I was assigned to do for Him. And I hadn't completed them. 
So in my mind and spirit, while the pilot, I have the headset on, he's got the headset on, I removed the mic down and I said, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I rebuke the spirit of death. I rebuke the, the attack of the enemy. I rebuke any strategy he has against me because I have not finished God's purpose and I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. And he miraculously, and I think it was a miracle, landed that plane on one engine in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I think it was a miracle of God that both of us didn't have at least some kind of back problem or injury or something happened uh, and it was a it was the act of God that protected us so the point I make is that you battle by the will of God and here's the second thing your strength of your battle is found in your covenant relationship with the Lord in other words if you have a covenant relationship it means everything that God has now belongs to you and it means everything that you have and you are belongs to God when the Lord spoke to Abraham to take Isaac his son Isaac and offer him right up here on the mountain on Mount Moriah Abraham could not say, I don't want to do that. And here's the reason why. Because Abraham had a covenant with God. That means Isaac actually belonged to God. But every promise that God had that he'd given to Abraham had to be fulfilled. So Abraham could offer his son knowing that if even if he was slain, God would have to raise him back up from the dead to make that nation of Israel come into existence. So I want to encourage you today that if you love the Lord and you've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, ask the Lord to baptize you in the power of the Holy Spirit. Study the Holy Spirit. Study from John chapter 14, 15, especially chapter 14 about the other comforter. And then talk about, read, read in the book of Acts the miracles and signs and wonders that happened because people were anointed by the Holy Spirit. So I'm coming to you again from the city of Jerusalem. I see the pinnacle, the temple, the top of the eastern gate, this beautiful stone wall that is here, the beautiful old olive trees, and Absalom's tomb. This is a traditional site said to be the tomb of Absalom, David's son, that rebelled against his father that allegedly was buried here. Now, I have an offer for the Manifest Telecast. It is important that you support us and stand with us if you want the program to continue in your area. I'll be back in a moment. I am very excited about an offer that we're making available just for three weeks. It's a book called The Code of the Holy Spirit. It is absolutely the most significant book the Lord has ever given me to write for the body of Christ that deals with the Holy Spirit from a Hebraic perspective. It's just a few of the chapters are the Day of Atonement, how the high priest spoke in the language of God. What is the chemistry of the anointing? What is the code of the dove? Why did God choose the dove as an emblem of the Holy Spirit? What about the code concealed in the menorah? What does the New Testament teach about women preachers? Can a believer blaspheme the Holy Spirit? This book contains this information and so much more. I'm including a two CD album, which was preached live in several services recently, a two CD album. And this is called, How the Spirit Helps Our Weaknesses. There are two titles that I want to present to you. One is is, the Spirit will help our infirmities. And the second is your prayer language and how to interpret the prayer language of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot of questions people have about speaking with tongues, diverse kinds of tongues, or what the Bible calls unknown tongues. We will cover that in this audio teaching. What about the tongues of angels that Paul talked about? What are devotional worship and intercession tongues or the prayer language of the Spirit that is used in that particular manner? What is the prayer language? What is it? How does God give it to you? How how can we interpret what we say in the Spirit? If you've often wondered about the Holy Spirit and what you hear about speaking with other tongues, which over 750 million people in the world have received, I think you're going to want this material. Very quickly, let me tell you how to get it. You can go to 1-888-21-BREAD, call our toll-free number, or go to perrystone.org and order, or include $30 or more for a donation and ask for HS122, and that's our offer, and uh, you can receive it. So the address is on the screen, the phone numbers are on the screen. We want you to call and get this right now for again, the book and the CDs are only available for a limited time. We're looking forward to hearing from you. I'm excited about our new offer. You know, we've had 175,000 men and women and young people baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I realize different people have different beliefs about the subject. But our book on the code of the Holy Spirit is going to go into the Hebraic perspective. We're also going to deal with the language of God, which is speaking with other tongues. And we're going to give the details about that. So if it's something you're interested in or you want more knowledge or more understanding, 
I want to encourage you to get this month's offer, which deals with the precious Holy Spirit, whom we love so much. He, Jesus sent him to us to be the other comforter. And uh, speaking of Jesus sending him to us, man, did we ever have a powerful warrior fest. I'm still in the afterglow about that weeks later. And just let's show you some clips right here. And you know, this, uh, we had back to back Warrior Fest 1, Warrior Fest 2. And also, you know, we're going to be having uh, our summer Warrior Fest. Uh, that's Friday through Sunday morning, July 14th to the 16th. So you all need to register for that. And you know, uh, you may not know the whole story, but the Lord spoke to me uh, several years ago uh, when I asked him, what would you have me to do? Uh, should you tarry for, let's say, 20 years? And I'm not saying he's going to tarry for 20 years. I was just asking that in prayer. And he said, do you want to go where I'm going? And I said, yes. He said, I'm going to the sons and daughters. And since that time, which has been many years ago, we have built a facility in Cleveland for a gathering place. And uh, we have seen a great uh, number of young people, literally thousands and thousands. Actually, in four Warrior Fest, we've had about 40,000 kids come into this town of Cleveland, Tennessee and be ministered to over the past several years. To God be the glory. Uh, so speaking of being ministered to, real quick, let me tell you where I'm going to be coming to. Come on down and join me in Knoxville, Tennessee at Redemption Church. That'll be June the 2nd through the 4th, Friday, Saturday, two services Saturday and two on Sunday. Church at Liberty Square, Wednesday, June, uh, June the 7th for their conference there, Cartersville, Georgia. Then all the young people pay attention. New Albany, Ohio, release the roar. And we're coming there on June 23rd, 24th, 25th. Remnant will be with me at that conference. And then we're going to be coming to Rod Parsley Church, Columbus, Ohio, Sunday, July the 2nd. We're going to have our summer encounter, as I mentioned a moment ago, which is Warrior Fest Summer, Friday through Sunday, July 14th through the 16th. And don't forget Evangel World Prayer Center, Louisville, Kentucky, June 20th through the 23rd. So you see, we have a full schedule plan for those of you who can join us in these meetings. And, uh, you know, I'm an evangelist at heart. Do you realize I have been preaching for 41 years? Does it seem that long? Yes and no. My father told me years ago, he said, they'll come to a point where it just seems like time will fly, Perry, and you'll look back on it and you'll sit there in a chair one day and be 75 years of age and say, where has time gone? Well, I'm not close to being 75 yet, but I can tell you, I look back and see the wonderful things God has done. And I guess that's why I'm so driven to try to do as much for the Lord, whether it's writing or preaching or traveling or hosting these great conferences and conventions that we host, because I want to see as many people touched personally through our ministry as possible. And let me just add why I'm saying this. I really appreciate so many of you who have partnered with us and I hope you're enjoying the Perry Stone private Facebook page and the 60 second a day uh, devotionals that we do. We call them nuggets and all the other things that we're providing uh, to you who are partners. I trust you're enjoying the devotionals and everything. And so thank you so much for standing with us and joining us. And I also want to say thank God for all of the wonderful stations who air us. Many of them are Christian stations uh, with satellites outside the United States that reach entire nations and countries. So pray for the gospel to go forth around the world. Pray especially for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ, especially in the Middle East and parts of the Far East uh, that are suffering so severely, many of their lives being taken because they take a stand for the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. And of course, they have that great martyr's crown. That's the highest level of crown you'll ever receive in heaven. But let's pray for our brothers and sisters. I'll be back with something very special. You got to watch this next week. Don't miss it. Perry Stone invites you to join him for his 2017 Israel tour. The dates are November 20th through the 29th with an optional visit to Petra in the country of Jordan. Call 1-888-321-3629 or visit perrystone.org for more information and how to register. Seating is limited, so call today.